My message today is another in our Paul in Acts series. This one is called How the Devil Works. So as you know, I've been going back and forth between this series of Paul in Acts with other messages, including some from the Psalms, and so this week I was a little bit torn. I had two different directions I wanted to go in. I wasn't sure which direction to go first, and then in my prayers, I started to see a connection between the two themes. And by the way, it related to some stuff that's going on in our world right now. As I looked at the next part of the Paul series, I started to see a theme, how the devil works. Then I looked at the psalm I was thinking about preaching next, and I saw it's really about, at least in a way, how God works. And then my mind was drawn to a third passage, which I think shows us how humanity works. So Lord willing, those are going to be the next three messages. Starting today with Paul in the next part of Acts chapter 19. But before we go there, we have to go way back. Back to the beginning. Back to Genesis chapter 3. And it's here that we start to see how the devil works. Now some of you may have heard me say this before, but there is a three-pronged attack that the devil used all the way back in the Garden of Eden and it's important that we know this because he uses the same attacks against us till this day. Genesis 3.1 Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? First thing he gets us to do is question the word of God. Does God really mean what he says? Especially what he says in his word. Now this is something of a trick question from the devil. God said they could eat from any tree in the garden except one. One tree God withheld. Some people say it was the tree of knowledge. Those people, whether they know it or not, have fallen for step three in the devil's scheme. See, it's not the tree of knowledge. God wanted us to have knowledge. He is not withholding knowledge from them. He wanted them to explore and learn and grow so much that he spent time with them in the garden, teaching them and answering their questions, among other things. What he was withholding, what he was withholding from them was one tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And again, they lived in a perfect garden with God, so they already knew good. What God was protecting them from was the knowledge of evil. If we look at verse 2, we see Eve answers this question correctly. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Good answer, Eve. But what follows next are the two attacks. And they happen in such rapid succession that you might miss them. But they're right here. Look at verse 4. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. Do you see it? He goes from questioning the word of God to contradicting the word of God. This is a really insidious attack. Because if God got this wrong, or even worse, if he lied, then we can't depend on what he says. He can't be trusted. That contradiction trips, chips away at the foundation of our faith. And then finally we get to the third attack in verse 5. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Step one, question the word of God. Step two, contradict the word of God. Step three, God is withholding from you. And it's something good that he's withholding. And if God withholds something good, it puts a question and a huge doubt in your mind. If God withholds good, is God really good? 
Of course, we know he wasn't withholding good, but we'll get to that. But there are three attacks, and they're all designed to do the same thing, to get us to stop trusting God. The devil hits us in our weakness and in our pride. Just like the devil desired to have the throne of God, so our corrupted human nature desires to sit on the throne of our own lives. To some degree, most of humanity wants to be its own God. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. They wanted to be like God. But the thing is, they were already created in God's image. And God in his kindness was shielding them from ever knowing evil. Satan hit them in the pride. They decided all that God offered wasn't enough. They wanted the throne. They wanted to rule and reign and be in charge of their own lives. The devil tried the same thing with Jesus. The devil tried to hit him in his weaknesses too. Now you might say, hold up, Dave. Jesus is God. He has no weaknesses. If you say that, I think you would be correct. Except for possibly one period of time. One period of time when the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He took on our humanity to be tempted as we are tempted. Now we know he was tempted, but he never fell to temptation. He never sinned. But the devil is not all-knowing. He saw God in the flesh walking around down here with the sinners. He knew flesh is weak. And it seems just like any other predator, at the first sign of possible weakness, the devil struck. Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. That human body of his had to be starving. And the devil knew Jesus held within him the power to do something about that hunger. But if he did something about that hunger, he would be walking away from God's plan. But someone who can make a universe can make a stone into bread. And we know Jesus fought the weakness with the word. And there's a lesson for us too, by the way. Fight the weakness with the word. See, Jesus refused to fall to the devil's temptation and said in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Next, the devil took him to the highest point of what was very likely a crowded temple and, G and told Jesus to throw himself off the roof. Now, he wasn't trying to get Jesus to commit suicide. The devil knew the word of God. Matthew 4, 6, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot on a stone. In other words, the devil knew God would protect Jesus. He's trying to tempt Jesus to take the easy way. At that point, people were having a hard time believing in Jesus. The reports about him were varied depending on who you asked. But if he threw himself off the roof in front of a large crowd and glided the 60-some feet to the ground safely without a scratch, surely then the people would take him seriously and believe. It had to be a great temptation. All the belief without all the pain. It seemed to me like a great shortcut. Good thing Jesus is smarter than me. Without the pain Jesus endured, there would be no sacrifice. And you and I would be lost forever. Yes, it would have made Jesus' earthly life easier. But it would also mean everyone, every person in history, past, present, and future, would be lost. And Jesus would have been separated from the Father. That one shortcut would have destroyed us all. Again, Jesus stood. He said, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That's Matthew 4, 7. Finally, Satan tried to hit Jesus in the area where most of us are weak, the area of greed. Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. 
Now, the first time I ever taught this passage was in vacation Bible school. I was teaching a bunch of third graders that year, and one of them was this really brilliant kid who asked me a question I was not prepared for. How could the devil offer Jesus that? It's not his to give. Now, ultimately, that's true. Though for a time, the world seems to be running by Satan's system. And if you don't believe that's true, watch the news. But regardless, this is how the devil works. Satan is a liar and the father of lies. The devil had his ultimate target in the crosshairs and he took his shot. To take Jesus down would be to defeat God's plan. And at the very least, to destroy what God loves most, you and me. And yes, it really does all belong to the Lord. But this temptation, this was a shortcut. The power and the possessions without all the pain. Jesus could have everything the world has to offer without the cross. Of course, the other side of this is for Jesus to fall to this would be to tear the Trinity apart. The devil was offering easy, quick, and painless on the surface, but it was a destructive lie. Jesus didn't fall for it. Look at verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Yes, Jesus didn't fall for it. But too often, we do. That's how the devil works. He gets us to question God. The devil gets us to contradict God. He gets us to doubt God, especially doubting God's love and goodness in hopes of breaking our trust in God. The devil hits us with temptations, usually in the areas where we're the weakest. He tries to lead us from doing God's will to taking the easy way out. And he appeals to our greed by offering stuff he can't deliver. Stuff that ultimately doesn't belong to him. And often it already belongs to us if we are children of the king. What is the devil's purpose in all this? Knowing he is doomed to destruction, his goal is to drag as many of us as he can to hell with him. Let's go to our text and see how this all works. Acts 19.23 About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. Now, when the Bible says the way, especially if the W in way is capitalized, it's referring to the church. The early church, the followers of the one who said, I am the way, Jesus Christ. What was the cause of the disturbance? Look at verse 24. A silversmith named Demetrius who made silver sh shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. Artemis, by the way, is the Greek goddess of the hunt, of fertility and more. Remember, Ephesus is a Greek thinking part of the Roman Empire. Now, of course, we know that Artemis is a false god. We know this because there is only one true god. Artemis is at best an idol and at worst a demon. And I lead toward the second de description, and a little while later, hopefully you'll see that. Before, but before we go there, look at what Demetrius has to say. He called them together along with the workers in the related trades and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see in here how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human gods are human hands are no gods at all. There is a danger, not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. There is so much in those three verses. Now on the surface, this might just feel like a religious dispute. It's as if Demetrius is saying, this guy Paul is speaking against my God and I don't like it. Right? That, that's almost how it feels, isn't it? You might even feel a little empathy for Demetrius. After all, you don't like it when people speak against our God, right? 
I've heard people, even well-meaning church folks, say things like, why would we send missionaries to that place? They already have their own religion. I guess that depends on whether or not we believe that Jesus is the only way. Because if we believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father, then missions are a must. I believe Paul and company were there because God sent them there. But work with me here a second. This is going to sound like a bunny trail, but I promise you it's not. Before I do a funeral, I sit down with the family to find out what to say about the deceased person. I want to know what the people who know the per knew the person best thought and felt. And what I've found more, than, more often than not is what they say first is most important. So what did Demetrius say to his fellow tradesmen? If you see it, you'll see almost immediately how the devil works. In Acts 19.25 we read, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. All of a sudden, this goes from a religious gathering to a union meeting. If this keeps up, we're going to lose our shirts. Now again, these people aren't Christians. They're not Jews. They're pagans. But what is the devil doing with them? He's using Demetrius to hit them right in the greed. Now again, you might say they're pagans. They're not believers. But why is Paul there? Paul is on a missionary journey. He's trying to reach these very people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's trying to give them the truth that sets men free. The devil doesn't want them to hear the gospel. Because if that happens, they might hear it and get saved. So instead, he uses their greed to fire them up against Paul. In the process, he gets them to question or to doubt Paul's teaching of God's word. This is the devil at work. He's using the same techniques he has used since the garden. So the devil working through Demetrius gets them to doubt the word of God as communicated through Paul. What does the devil do next? Well, let's look at the next verse. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. Do you see it? After getting them to doubt God's word, he says Paul has convinced and led people astray. Large numbers of people, and not just here in Ephesus, but all across the province of Asia. After getting them to doubt the word of God, he starts to paint Paul as a villain who's leading their people astray. Now Paul and his message, not to mention the God he represents, are a problem to be stopped. They're not just doubtful, they're not good. Same technique used in the garden. Their greed and their animosity will close their hearts to the truth that would set them free. It's not surprising, right? These guys would be upset. It's their business, it's their livelihood. If Paul is right, then their life's work is a lie. And they can't have that. It'll cost them too much in power and prestige. It will cost them too much money. I'll say it again. They're getting hit right in the greed. The devil through Artemis has convinced them that he will give them the kingdoms of their little world if they just will bow down and worship him. Just like the devil tried with Jesus in the desert, except that they're too blinded by their greed to hear Paul and receive the truth. Then look at what Demetrius says next about Paul. This is the second part of 26. Paul says that God's made by human God hands, let me say that again, God's made by human hands are no gods at all. And part of me wants to scream, well, duh! Look, I make a lot of stuff in a year. I draw and paint pictures. I build models. I create all kinds of stuff. And just so we're clear, Nothing I make is alive. Don't bring up my children. I played a part there, but God made them. Nothing I make is perfect, and nothing I make deserves worship. And I have seen the works of some amazing artists. I have seen some of the greatest works of art ever made, made by the greatest people ever to make art. And you know what? 
none of them have made life either. None of their work is worthy of worship either. None of their work can save a soul. Oh, the best ones point to the one who can save, but none of their work on its own can save. No, the one I worship is not someone I made. I worship the one who made me. And the things I make are designed, hopefully, to bring him glory. The arguments of Demetrius are designed to show that Paul and his God are not good. The same thing the devil tried in the garden. The same thing that convinced our first parents to fall and in the process doomed everyone. That's how the devil works. Then look at 27 one more time. There is danger. Not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. So which came first? What does he talk about first? Greed comes before goddess. We'll lose money. And the goddess will be discredited. Along with her temple. You remember the temple of Artemis that brings people from all over the world just to see it? And all those people coming to the temple helped Demetrius and his cronies to sell more shrines. Of course, it also helps to lead more people astray with their idols which brings them closer to the devil and further to God, further from God because that's how the devil works. And look at the last part of the verse. 27b, we'll call it. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. All of a sudden, he cares about the goddess. All of a sudden, he wants to protect the goddess. And that might be the thing that convicts me the most out of this whole story. You see, I look at that. I look at his reaction to wanting to protect the goddess. And it looks, and I think rightfully so, pathetic. Their goddess needs them to protect her. Can I tell you? If your God needs you to protect him, if your God needs protection coming from you, <laughs> Something is backwards and upside down. The true God, the only God, is the creator of the heavens and earth. He doesn't need our protection. We need his protection. Sometimes I think that's how the devil works in us as believers, or at least that's how he works in me. See, someone says something negative about God, and I want to fight it. I want to come to his defense. And I guess in a way that's good because I love him, but he does not need my defense, especially if I'm tempted to act like the devil to defend him. Am I speaking the truth in love, or do I just want to give them a verbal beating? And if I give them that beating, will it bring them any closer to Jesus? Or am I just being prideful, thinking that God is not enough to defend himself? Unlike Artemis of the Ephesians, no one can rob my God of his divine majesty. And I'm afraid the ones that come closest to robbing him of his majesty are the believers who don't think he can defend himself. Should I stand up for Jesus? Absolutely. We're going to sing about that in a minute. But you can't stand up for Jesus by acting like the devil. So Demetrius stirs up the crowd. And what is their response? When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. They were not going to see a show, folks. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to come to the theater. Have you seen this kind of behavior in our world? The people get stirred up in false beliefs, and they start chanting stuff and rioting and destroying property, vandalizing and burning and more, and it all has its roots in how the devil works. They're stirred up, standing up for a lie in the face of the truth. 
They become a mob. And the mob becomes so dangerous that they begin to seize their opponents. And people have to be protected from them. This is more of the technique. Truth is right there. But they fight against it so hard that it can't get to them. What's amazing is the people of God still try. Verse 32, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some were shouting another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. <laughs> Have you seen those protests lately on the news? Have you seen how many times a reporter will go up to one of them and ask them why they're there and they don't even know? They're all over the news. Verse 33. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Someone was right there, ready, willing, and able to step forward and speak the truth in love. He brought the truth that would set them free. But as soon as they saw he belonged to God, they shouted him down and they kept shouting so they wouldn't have to hear the truth. I saw this recently. There was a street preacher trying to share truth with a chaotic mob at a protest. He had the truth that would set them free. But the devil was at work, making them doubt the word of God, discrediting the word and questioning the goodness of God. So the people just began to shout this poor street preacher down, screaming in his face, literally this far away, screaming in his face and even barking like dogs. The truth was there and they didn't want to hear it. They'd rather riot than hear from God. They'd rather take what the devil convinces them is the easy way out, staying in their sin as he leads them down the road that leads to destruction, convinced that God can't be good because he doesn't want them to destroy themselves in sin. The truth that sets men free is right there. But they shouted it down. Friends, that's how the devil works. Folks, the good news is the devil stands defeated. Thank the Lord, God is still on the throne, never to be removed. Thank God he is still in the business of setting the captives free. There is no one greater than our God. And no matter how the devil works, the Lord is on our side. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Yes, the devil may be working overtime, but God is still more powerful. And he is at work in our world too. Lord willing, we'll look at how God works next week. Amen.